Welcome back to another installment of Vintage Egyptologist. Today we are going to be introducing a topic that I know all of you are interested in, hieroglyphs. By the end of today's video, you are going to know the origin of the term hieroglyph, how to differentiate between hieroglyphs, hieratic, and demotic, where to start reading an ancient Egyptian inscription, and the three different uses of hieroglyphs within the text. So let's begin with uh, the most elementary aspect of the topic today, the terminology we'll use. Now, almost everyone has heard of hieroglyphs. That goes back to the ancient Greek term ta hieroglyphica, the sacred script. And by glyph, it really means the sacred carved script of the ancient Egyptians. And the ancient Egyptians themselves called it medu nature, divine words. No matter what other scripts came into the Nile Valley, the Egyptians never abandoned hieroglyphs because it had religious significance. Now, hieroglyphs, as the name implies, are a sacred script, a formal script, and they should be carved. There are some painted hieroglyphs as well that are made with the nice borders, the, the crisp edges, internal details. Individual hieroglyphs can be miniature works of art sometimes. But if you need to write a letter to someone or need to jot a note, write a receipt, um, the ancient Egyptians wouldn't traditionally use hieroglyphs for that. And as some of you may know, ultimately they had two forms of cursive script. The words we use for these go back, I believe, to Herodotus, who described one as what we call hieratic. Uh, for his time, it was the cursive script of priests. It had been the standard cursive that developed over time, that had been in use for millennia by the time Herodotus is writing. But in his time, it was an old-fashioned cursive, so only the priests learned it. And by the time of Herodotus, really by the middle of the first millennium BCE, there's an even more pared down cursive that he calls the popular script or demotic. So same root as democracy. From demos, or the people. So we technically think of Egyptians as having three scripts, hieroglyphic, formal script, hieratic, the traditional cursive for a long period of time, and then demotic, the cursive from, let's say, very roughly middle of the first millennium BCE to about the middle of the first millennium CE, when the ancient scripts in Egypt die. Now, hieroglyphs change over time to some extent, and the hieratic, the cursive, changes over time. You can date things according to these changes, and the study of these changes of the appearance of the signs is called paleography. So we'll talk a little bit more about paleography. Now, there are other forms of the script that don't get talked about quite so much. There's something that's in between hieroglyphs and hieratic, what we might call cursive hieroglyphs. This is sometimes referred to as book script, because the Book of the Dead can be written in this cool. book script. <laughs> So media, where you are writing the inscription or writing in ink, is what really dictates the script. If you're going to carve in stone, you will use hieroglyphs. If you're going to write a letter on papyrus, you will use hieratic. But then there's also an element of development over time. If you're writing a letter, say, in 200 BCE, you will be using demotic. In fact, we have evidence of priests, probably from the Roman period, still able to write a pretty decent archaic form of hieratic. We, we see an inscription like that that Darshan published from the Temple of Smithis in the Wadi Halal, east of Al-Kab, where we work. To introduce the topic of ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs, we have to start with the three uses of a hieroglyphic sign. The first is phonetic. So most hieroglyphs that you see in an ancient Egyptian text actually represent sounds. So it might look like an owl or a basket or a horned viper, 
but what they're actually writing are the sounds represented by those signs. So I'm going to give you one quick example that I can do just sitting here, and that is a human hand cut off essentially at the wrist. And when you see that human hand, it is the sound D. We call that a uniliteral because it represents a single consonant. There are also bi and triliterals that have two or even three consonants. The second use of a hieroglyphic sign is as an ideogram. And what this means is that the hieroglyph is functioning both phonetically and the meaning of the word is what that sign actually represents. So to take another example that I can use just sitting here is the arm, the human arm cut off a little bit above the elbow. That is an ayan sound that exists in modern Arabic and ancient Egyptian and other Afro-Asiatic languages, but not in English. So we normally just write it as an A, although strictly speaking, that's not what it is phonetically. So the ayan arm is used as the sound ayan in multiple, many, many, many words. But if you have that same arm and you put a vertical stroke underneath it, that means read it both phonetically as ayan, but also what the word means. That stroke says we're talking about a physical arm. And then finally, the third form of hieroglyphs, the third usage we could say, is as a determinative. And a determinative indicates the class to which a word belongs. So for example, if you're talking about a verb of motion, you'd use a pair of legs. If you're talking about Basenjis, Chesham dogs, you would actually have a picture of a Basenji, and there are examples that look just like Narmer at the end of the word. And so that Basenji determinative, Narmer at the end of a hieroglyphic word, doesn't add any phonetic meaning, but it gives you a clue as to what that word means. The other really significant aspect of determinatives in ancient Egypt is that hieroglyphs do not have word breaks. So when you see a line of hieroglyphic text, one word follows another without a space. But if you learn to recognize the determinatives, it is surprising how quickly you can pick up on, well, this is a determinative, so that must be the end of a word. The predominant writing direction for the ancient Egyptians is right to left. Certainly for the cursive scripts, that's really the only way they wrote, with very few exceptions. I've seen a couple of graffiti where someone wrote hieratic left to right. It doesn't look very pretty. It's, it's not great. Hieroglyphs, on the other hand, are, are exceptional. They can be written left to right, right to left, or in vertical columns. So they really function as an element in the decoration. In fact, the ancient Egyptians probably wouldn't understand our use of the term um, annotation or decoration. For them, it's all visual communication. There's a verb sechai or sesh to write, but it can also mean to draw, it can mean to paint, it can even mean to, to put on makeup. So when you see a hieroglyphic text, and you know it can be read either left to right or right to left. And if it's in columns, it's always from the top to the bottom. But the question is, where do you start? And this is actually really easy. You always read toward the faces. If John and I were hieroglyphs and inscription, let's say we're on either side of a doorway, and they love to do that to make it symmetrical, you would read John from left to right, but you would read me from right to left. And sometimes they will have an inscription um, that begins, let's say, in the middle of a doorway and reads in one direction on the one side and another direction in the other. And there might be an ankh sign right in the middle that you would read with each text in each direction. I think we should be able to find an example. Of that. Oh, absolutely. Yes, that's very common on doorways, what are so-called false doors because they were doors for the spirit to receive offerings, like the Ka spirit of the deceased. Ancient Egyptian is the longest continuous tradition of writing 
in world civilizations. Thus far. <laughs> its origins go back as far as 3,250 BCE, during the reign of a king named Scorpion. And this is a story we will tell in detail later. He probably called himself Scorpion. Most likely. And you're the first ruler of Dynasty Zero. It's really about that time that we see the proto-writing turning into true early hieroglyphic script. In the earliest phase of the Egyptian language, we call it Old Egyptian. This is the language of autobiographical texts of the 3rd, 4th, 5th, and 6th dynasties, and also the pyramid texts, which themselves are pretty archaic by the first time they're attested at the end of the 5th dynasty. During the Middle Kingdom, we call the phase of the language Middle Egyptian. I mean, what's really interesting about this is that we see Middle Egyptian obviously beginning even before the old Egyptian textual tradition, mm -hmm. let's say, is, is dead. And then late Egyptian that we traditionally say really begins to enter the written tradition around the time of Amenhotep II through Akhenaten in the middle of the 18th dynasty, we actually get late Egyptianisms showing up even as early as, let's say, the, the late Old Kingdom, uh, the time of early Middle Egyptian. So, so to put this into terms that we can kind of understand in this world, it's as if you took an abbreviation, OMG, and it somehow made it into a law. So laws tend to be a higher register, much more formal language, whereas what you're going to text on your phone is going to be much more colloquial. So as the Egyptian language goes forward, you have more and more representations of the colloquial language in writing, but then there are other genres like laws or historical inscriptions where you really expect the language to be formal. But those two registers can exist simultaneously. It's both chronological and it depends on the formality of what you're saying. It does. So, so this is something that's usually referred to as diglossia. So in other words, in ancient Egypt, if I wrote a letter in very nice late Egyptian during the reign of Ramses II. About 1250 BCE. That would be completely normal, wouldn't phase anyone. It would be totally acceptable, expected, proper. Mm -hmm. But if I wrote a letter in old Egyptian, if I tried to mimic the formulations of, let's say, one of those first intermediate period letters to the dead from around 2100 BCE or so, that would shock people. That would seem very strange. It would be like texting in the style of the King James Bible. And yet at the same time, if I have a religious treatise and mm -hmm. I have a, say, a quotation out of an earlier religious text, I might bring that old register of the language in and it would be completely proper. Hmm. It would be acceptable. And when you look at the script, you can have that same level of formality versus informality. You, until very late in Egyptian history, would not see hieratic carved on a temple wall as an original that's supposed to be on the temple. In fact, are there any examples where the first script on a temple wall is hieratic? I know there are those Dakhla stele from the 300 It begins in the, I, I believe it begins in the first millennium BCE that you really start to see more formal monuments made with hieratic as the script of the monument, but already Really, the classic period for this is the Middle Kingdom. Already beginning around 2000 BCE, we do start to see the development of lapidary hieratic. This hybrid cursive hieroglyphic script. You might, it's almost like it's a, it's a cursive script that has aspects of hieroglyphic orthography introduced into it. So you can write it relatively quickly. You don't have to be trained as a hieroglyphic scribe, but it still imparts an aura of the formality that hieroglyphs always bring with them. One of the things we should point out is that students nowadays, you know, everyone learns hieroglyphs first when you learn to read and write Egyptian. But as That's far as we can... That's not what it would have been. As far as we can tell for, and, yeah, as far as we can tell for antiquity, 
you would first learn cursive because that's what you would need if you made a receipt, if you wrote a letter to someone, if you signed your name on something, etc. So we, we have evidence at rock inscription sites of a, of a number of people who are probably entirely literate when it comes to day-to-day -day life, even, even writing complex letters, possibly even legal documents, etc. But when they have to say, I'm going to write this in hieroglyphs because I have some time on my hands, I'm going to try to carve this. Sometimes the carving doesn't look that great uh, because they're a little bit uncertain as to what hieroglyphic sign or what hieroglyphic group matches the hieratic they want to transcribe in hieroglyphs.